Okay, so uh, moving on in the rickets section, uh, uh, we're going to talk about what's the contemporary medical management in rickets and what to supplement and for how long. Uh, I think uh, Dr. Darko has already uh, referred to uh, the various sub uh, types of rickets and actually the uh, nutritional or the uh, vitamin D deficient rickets is the most common and we'll talk about that. And uh, as already alluded to, it's uh, uh, both calcium and vitamin D deficiencies which can actually produce clinical manifestations of uh, rickets. Now vitamin D is, uh, the pre-vitamin uh, pre D is uh, present in the skin and exposure to UV rays uh, produces vitamin D which gets hydroxylated by the liver and then again by the kidney and forms the active form which actually performs all the functions. So uh, uh, the question is uh, what to prescribe in rickets and then how to monitor these children uh, uh, for adequate treatment. So uh, it basically boils down to sun, food and supplements. These are sources of uh, vitamin D. And if we look at sunlight exposure, is it really enough to supplement the vitamin D? And if we see 90% of the vitamin D is really derived from sunlight. And about 10 to 15 minutes of direct sunlight uh, can produce up to 10 to 20,000 international units of vitamin D. But the best time is actually in the day because the parents will ask you what time should we expose the child to sunlight and it's between 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. And in hot climates, especially places like India, that's difficult. Also variations with season skin pigmentation uh, can uh, prolong the time of exposure needed for adequate vitamin D production. And dark skin people require five to 10 times of the exposure. So sunlight basically is not such a good source of vitamin D production for our country. Well, can diet help? And the parents will typically ask you, doctor, what should I give, to my, ch give my child to eat? Because that's the most important thing, which they think is gonna make their bones stronger. Well, about less than 10% of the vitamin D is derived from diet. And diets written phytates and oxalates reduce the absorption of vitamin D. And there are no good vegetarian sources of vitamin D. And if we look at various sources of food which uh, contribute to vitamin D, even fortified formula milk uh, requires a large amount of uh, milk uh, consumption to give you adequate doses. And when we assess the vitamin D deficiency, we are really measuring the 25-hydroxy D because the 125-hydroxy is actually very tightly regulated and requires, and the levels will not form a, a fall until there's very severe deficiency. Uh, looking at who's vitamin D deficient, uh, uh, levels less than 20 nanograms per ml, people uh, really need the treatment. And intoxication levels are when levels exceed 150 nanograms per ml. Well, when supplementing vitamin D, we know what to, uh, we need to see what to prescribe, what's available, what's better, and definitely what not to do. So uh, just looking at all these uh, areas which are circled are the uh, forms of vitamin D which uh, possibly can be used and it can get quite confusing and uh, we need to uh, figure out which vitamin D to prescribe in which patient. So let's look at them uh, shortly. Vitamin, and this is uh, another study from India which looked at the various products uh, which are available in the market. And uh, surprisingly, the vitamin D2, uh, which are the plant sources, were contributed to less than uh, 1%, while the D3 uh, was the most commonly available product in the market. And uh, surprisingly, the calcidiol and the calcitriol, the active forms of vitamin D, comprise the majority of the products available in the market. This is a 2016 study. So looking at vitamin D2, these are derived from plant sources. Uh, these are less potent as compared to vitamin D3 and require almost thrice the dosage as compared to D3. But these, are, uh, uh, these work as well as vitamin D3. The D3 is actually the preferred uh, vitamin D supplement for nutritional rickets. They're available in capsules, injections, and liquid uh, suspensions, drops, and are most commonly used and are probably the best. The calcidiol um, is, uh, has a shorter half-life, rapid onset of action, and uh, is probably best suited for people with uh, liver dysfunction. And the calcitriol is, uh, again, has a rapid onset of action, short half-life, can produce hypercalcemia. And the important thing to know is it does not affect the 25 OHD level. So you can keep taking the calcitriol, and the vitamin uh, 25 OHD levels may remain the same. Um, also, uh, it's indicated in patients with renal rickets. Well, doxycalciferol is uh, used to treat uh, secondary hyperparathyroidism, 
and uh, it's again mostly used for patients in renal dialysis. So then what's the dose? About 100 units of vitamin D3 is, uh, raises the levels of 25 OHD by 1 nanogram per ml and we need to main, uh, maintain the levels to about 20 to 30 nanograms per ml. Uh, what's the best route of administration? Some people will say do IM shot, some people say oral. Well, oral works better than IM and uh, normalizes the levels quicker. And IM is to be used only when it's a compliance issue. So when people are not following treatment, then you can give them a depot shot. Uh, does schedule matter? Daily, weekly, monthly, three monthly, or six monthly? Well, uh, there are studies which have shown that it really doesn't matter. And all routes, uh, all uh, the schedules have uh, equal efficacy and will equalize uh, the levels over a period of time. So the commonly uh, used schedules are uh, weekly uh, 60,000 units uh, for two months, followed by daily dosage of 600 to 800 units, or a depot injection, again followed by a daily supplementation. For non-compliant patients, you can give repeated intramuscular shots of STOS therapy. So do we need to supplement calcium or is vitamin D sufficient? So we need to do calcium and vitamin D and the reason for that is that as the parathyroid levels normalize, there's a hypocalcemic state which is created, which is called the hungry bone syndrome and you need calcium to supplement this problem. Also, uh, studies have been done which shows that the response to treatment is much better if you supplement the calcium with vitamin D. So, uh, which calcium to take? The calcium carbonate probably is the best. It's most effective, and, but it needs to be taken with meals as it needs an acidic medium for absorption. And the citrates are used for people who are on proton pump inhibitors as it doesn't need an acidic medium for absorption. Well, how much calcium? Uh, not more than 500 milligrams at a time and not more than 1,000 to 2,000 milligrams in a given day. Well, how to monitor the response? What labs to do? How often to repeat the labs? And do we need x-rays? So at one month, you need calcium, phosphorus, alkaline phosphatase. Three months, calcium, phosphorus, magnesium, alkaline phosphatase, PTH, 25 OHD, urine, calcium, creatinine ratio, and x-rays. And at one year and annually after that, the vitamin D levels. And if there is poor healing by three months, you have to consider a resistant rickets. The calcium and phosphorus will normalize in six to 10 days, PTH and 25 OHD in one to two months. Alkaline phosphatase usually takes three to six months, and X-ray should show healing by one to three months. Thank you very much.